Well, I told Freddie Friday night at the ice cream supper that I'm always um, happy to have an opportunity to preach, but the only negative thing would be uh, by doing so, I wouldn't be able to hear him <laughs> because I enjoy hearing him so very much, and we are so very blessed uh, to uh, have Freddie, and you've had him for a long, lot longer time than Janice and I have <laughs> since we haven't been here that long, but we love and appreciate Freddie and Tammy and their family and appreciate the great work he does in the kingdom and we pray God's blessings upon him in this gospel meeting. I appreciate Brother Ricky and his uh, choice of some songs about the subject on which I will be speaking today and that is heaven. You know when we when we think about heaven there have been a lot of anecdotes that have been uh, have been shared about um, those who have reached the proverbial pearly gates, you know, after dying and things that have been said or done there. Uh, years ago, my nephew shared one with me by email that I'll share with you this morning. It seemed that three friends all died in an accident, tragically, but they found themselves at the proverbial pearly gates and they were talking with each other and they were asking each other, what would you like to think right now that people are saying as they pass by your casket and as they see you there what would you like to think they're saying right now and one of them said well I'd like to I'd like to think that they're saying that I was a great physician this man was a doctor I'd like to think that I was a great physician that I had been responsible for saving many many lives and that I was a great family man as well and the second one said, well, I'd like to hear them saying that I was a great husband and father, but that I also was a great educator, a school teacher, and that many children's lives had been changed as a result of my influence. And then the third one spoke up and said, I'd like to hear them say, look, he's moving. <laughs> now think about that. Here was a man... <laughs> Here was a man who supposedly was, uh, was saved, going to be in eternity, ultimately in heaven, and yet the thing he wanted our, those on earth to be saying about him was, he's still with us. Look, he's moving. Well, it uh, reminds us about how easily sometimes our thoughts can become so centered on the things of this world that we don't think a lot about the things of the next world. How many thoughts have you had recently about heaven as your ultimate home? You know, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, beginning that though our outward man is perishing, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Paul there is telling us how to deal with the things of this world, even the afflictions and trials of this world, by, by looking at the things of the next world. And so this morning, for a few minutes, I'd like for us to think more about the things of the next world. And specifically, I'd like for us to simply deal with the question, what is heaven? What is heaven? And my sermon is really one sentence. But don't get too excited about being out real early because I do plan to elaborate some on that one <laughs> sentence. But the one sentence that I'd like for us to think about this morning is heaven. Heaven is the future home of the few who are faithful where they will be free forever. Now that is a summary of what I'd like for us to think about together this morning. That is heaven, I believe. Heaven is the future home of the few who are faithful where they will be free forever. Now think about it. Heaven is, first of all, the future home. Have you ever heard the expression about something that is being described? Well, that is simply heaven on earth. That is just heaven on earth. There is no such thing. There is no heaven on earth. That's an impossibility in the literal sense. 
But it really is an impossibility in the sense that nothing in this life will ever compare with the things of the next life. Now, having said that, there is, there is a foretaste of heaven on earth. What is the foretaste of heaven on earth? It's the church at Dunlap to me. <laughs> the church is the foretaste of heaven on earth. And I know of no finer congregation than the one right here. This is a foretaste of heaven, but it is not heaven. It is not our home, but it is the foretaste of our home. It should be. And the unity that is enjoyed in the church here, the fellowship, the encouragement, the edification, the evangelism of which we are privileged to be a part, all of that is, is something that's so encouraging and uplifting, and it is very much a foretaste of heaven but it is not heaven itself. Along these lines, there are those in the religious world who tell us that we already have eternal life now. That in effect, we do have heaven. No, we're not there, but we, we are in a state of salvation which can never change. And once we are saved, we are always saved. There is that prevalent and, and pernicious doctrine that permeates the religious world around us today. But that, too, is completely false. We can lose the salvation that we now enjoy if we are Christians. And the foretaste of heaven that we now have can be erased completely from our lives unless we remain faithful. And yet there are those who say, well, there's a passage that uh, says in John 10, for example, verse 27, that my sheep hear my voice and I know them, they follow me and I give them eternal life and no, uh, no one is able to snatch them from my Father's hand. My Father who is greater than all has given to me and no one is able to snatch them from my Father's hand. Is that telling us that we in effect have eternal life now and that it's not future? No. Jesus made that passage very clearly conditional when he said, my sheep hear my voice, that's a condition, and they follow me, that's another condition, and then I give them what? Eternal life. In what? In reality? Now? No. In prospect. In promise. 1 John 2.25 says, this is the promise he promised us, dash, eternal life. A promise is not a reality. A promise is a promise. And what about Titus 1 and verse 2? where Paul wrote, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. What did he say again? In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. We live in hope of our future home. We live in hope of eternal life. In fact, we don't hope for that which we already possess, do we? And so if it is in hope of eternal life in which we live, then we do not have eternal life in reality now. And in Romans 8, 24, Paul, by inspiration, made it abundantly clear that a man does not hope for that which he already has. An inspired man made the argument. So when he said in Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life, and he said we don't, we don't live in hope of something we already have, then we cannot have eternal life in reality now. But we do have the assurance that it will be ours in reality in the future if we remain faithful unto death. And we'll talk more about that faithfulness as we go further in our sentence. But notice also, heaven is the future home. Well, let me get John 14, our scripture reading in here, first too, and remind us that Jesus said, I am going to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So obviously the future home of the faithful will not be a renovated earth, as some erroneously contend in the religious world. This world will be destroyed, the earth will be burned up, and everything in it, as Peter so abundantly and clearly tells us in his writings, it will be no more. And so the place that will ultimately be our home, our future home, is the place that Jesus has gone even now to prepare and has promised to return to receive us to himself. But heaven is the future home, as we go further, of the few. I wish this were not the case. And I dare say I could speak for everyone here this morning and say that you wish that were not the case as well. Who in the world wants only a few to be saved eternally? 
uh, a completely evil individual would be the only one I could think of. Anyone who's thinking as he or she ought to think would desire the salvation of all mankind. In fact, Paul expressed it in 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4 when he said, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God's dream, if you will, is that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's the dream of God. Therefore, it would be our dream. But it is not the reality of tragically that we face in the world in which we live and Jesus reminded us of that very clearly in Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 when he admonished enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go in by it because what narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life and there are what there are few who find it few who find it that's the greatest tragedy of our day it's the greatest tragedy of yesterday it's the greatest tragedy of tomorrow that there will be but few who will find eternal life in heaven think back to Noah and what Peter wrote about those in Noah's day wherein few that is eight souls were saved by water 1 Peter 3 verse 20 Few, eight souls out of all those alive on earth. Oh, I know that not only is it the desire of many to be saved, but desire must be coupled with expectation in order for hope to exist. That's biblical hope. And expectation can only be based upon what is revealed in Scripture and our compliance with what is revealed in Scripture if we're to have that hope heaven is the future home of the few and then we add who are faithful but I dare say if you conducted a survey in Dunlap or Chattanooga or anywhere else in this country and you knocked on doors and you asked those who claimed to be religious do you consider yourself to be completely faithful many would say absolutely yes I am faithful and I anticipate ultimately being in heaven but by whose definition do we determine faithfulness it cannot be determined by a better felt than told experience it cannot be subjective it must be completely objective and so faithfulness has to be determined by the Word of God and are we glad that that is the case aren't you really glad that faithfulness can be objectively determined by what is written in the New Testament, the last will and testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Otherwise, if we were basing it upon feeling, I might say to Ricky, Ricky, I believe you're lost. And he might say, well, I believe I'm saved. How are we going to settle that? If we don't have an objective standard, we'll just have to wait and see who's right in the judgment. I don't want to wait till then to have assurance of my salvation. I want to know that I know that I know that I know, as the late Franklin Camp used to say. And I can know. Hereby we do know that we know him, John wrote in 1 John 2, 3, if we keep his commandments. And so faithfulness is determined by Scripture. And so we ask, who are the faithful? Let me suggest a few points along these lines. First of all, the faithful are those who feed. 1 Peter 2, 1 and 2. Therefore, laying aside all malice and all guile, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speakings, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word, as the New King James renders it, that you may grow thereby. If we're going to be considered faithful, once we have become children of God by belief in Jesus that leads us to repent of our sins, confess him as the Christ, and to be buried with him in baptism, to be added to his kingdom, the church, then we must be feeders. We must feed. Growth is absolutely essential to the Christian life. And growth does not occur by passage of time alone. Someone who's, be, who's been in the Lord's church for 30 years may be as much a babe as someone who's been in the Lord's church 30 days. Maybe more so, depending upon what that 30-day child of God has done with those 30 days and what that 30-year person has done with those 30 years. You see, it takes effort 
we are to feed. Peter says desire. There's the first key. The attitude is, I desire the pure milk of the word that I may grow thereby, the American Standard adds, unto salvation, the ultimate goal. And remember what the Hebrews writer wrote to those Hebrew Christians in Hebrews 5, 12 through 14, and said, when the time has come that you ought to be teachers, you have need that someone teach you again the very first principles of the oracles of God, and you have become such as have need of milk and not of solid food. And then he goes on to add that milk's for babies. Solid food is for those who have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. That takes industry. That takes effort. Therefore, we must apply ourselves to the process of feeding. But the faithful are also those who are focused. In Colossians 3, 1 through 3, if, you were, if then you were raised with Christ, Paul writes, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We hear a lot today about a certain mindset. So-and-so has a certain mindset. Paul tells us the very mindset we're to have as Christians. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. That's where our focus should be. And closely related to that point is that the faithful are those who are far-sighted. We are not simply looking at the here and now and what is happening to us in the here and now. In fact, by being far-sighted, we can better deal with the here and now, whatever the here and now brings to us. Because if we keep our sights far-sighted, then we can deal much better with the afflictions and the present trials that will inevitably come to everyone who seeks to live the Christian life. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution of some form <coughs> to some degree, Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. How do we deal with that? By being farsighted. And that's part of what Peter describes in the great Christian graces, as we so often call them in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11. And for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith, what? Virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, they make that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he adds in verse 9, for who ever lacks these things. For he who lacks these things is what? Short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent, he adds, to make your calling and election sure. For in doing so, you shall never stumble. For so an entrance shall be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, the Christian graces are crucial, aren't they? Because the promise to those who have them in abundance is an abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom, heaven. Not getting in by the skin of your teeth, but listen to it, an abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom. And so we can approach the judgment or our death <laughs> and the inevitable judgment that follows with confidence and assurance if we are applying ourselves to the Christian graces and possessing them. We don't have to live in fear and trepidation. We can live in confidence and in hope by being far-sighted. But also, the faithful are those who are forgiving. Ephesians 4 and verse 32, and be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ also forgave you. The forgiven are to be forgiving. Now, there is a distinction between a forgiving spirit and being able to extend actual forgiveness. Luke 17, 3, Jesus said, if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, what? Forgive him. But even if he won't repent, I still should have a forgiving spirit and do everything I can to bring about his repentance so that I can extend forgiveness, but I cannot extend forgiveness to one who won't repent of sin any more than God can. Does God expect me to do what he himself will not do? No, but he does expect me to be tender-hearted 
and have that forgiving spirit and be eager and ready to extend forgiveness to my brother or my sister who sins against me and to do it happily and to do it speedily. Yes, the faithful are those who are forgiving. But you know something? There are also those who are forgetful. That's right, they're forgetful. Philippians 3, 13 and 14 reminds us that the one who is faithful is one who is forgetful about certain things. Paul wrote, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to the things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Forgetting those things that are behind. Forget your successes, yes, to a certain extent. That's not a bad idea. Forget your failures, yes, if they're going to keep you, keep you from moving forward in a fruitful way in the future. I've said about preachers and missionaries, they'd all be better off to forget their accomplishments and let the Lord remind them of them in the judgment. Because pride is a great pitfall of anyone. Anyone. And so we need to be forgetful and we certainly don't need to let sins that have been truly forgiven because we have turned from them in accordance with the will of God and they have been forgiven we certainly don't need to be harder on ourselves than God is and we don't allow our past sins if they have been blotted forevermore from God's book of remembrance to hinder us in our future service and our present service we need to forgive ourselves if we've done those things that bring about God's forgiveness and then also the faithful are those who are fatigued that's right worn out <laughs> Hebrews 4 11 the King James says let us labor to enter into that rest I don't see a passage anywhere in the New Testament that says let us rest to enter into that rest but let us labor to enter into that rest. The New King James says, give diligence. That's activity. That's industry. That's effort. We have to make that effort to enter into God's rest. And when does that rest come? Well, it's when I hit 70 in November. That's when I'm giving up. No. No, I may not be able to do what I once did, nor can you if you're older as I am may not be able to do everything you once did physically or otherwise but you can certainly serve the Lord to the fullest extent of your ability and yes as we grow older there are things we can offer to those who are younger hopefully if we've applied ourselves to spiritual growth that can be beneficial for as long as we live till we draw our last and final breath and the example of so many who are here this very morning by your very presence when perhaps your physical health is not what, it, what you'd like for it to be, but you made the effort to be here and to worship God. And that's an example to all of us. You know, I years ago preached at Red Bank in the 80s, and we had an elder who's gone on to his reward now. In fact, all the elders under whom I had served back then have now gone on to their reward. They were great men. But I remember Brother Robert Taylor often in his prayers would express something like this. Lord, wear us out in your service and then take us home. I'll never forget that expression. Wear us out in your service and then take us home. And that's what the faithful desire, to be worn out in the service of the Lord and then taken home. But finally, the faithful are also those who obviously must finish. We have to finish what we have begun. Revelation 2, 10, Jesus through John to the church at Smyrna said, do not fear the things that, are about, that you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. And he didn't mean literally 10 days. He meant an undetermined period of time. It was going to be longer than 10 days. Going to be pretty complete persecution was the idea of that figure. 
But then he added in the latter part of the verse, the part with which we're probably most familiar, be faithful until death, even in death, and I'll give you the crown of life. That is eternal life as your crown. And so we have to finish. We can't remain faithful until five minutes before death. We have to remain faithful even in death. And I dare say that in the first century, the Christians who were brought before kings and rulers who were opposed to Christianity and determined to wipe it from the face of the earth faced this decision. Either you recant concerning your belief in Christ, either you renounce Jesus Christ, or in five minutes you will be dead. And I dare say there were some who probably recanted and renounced Jesus and saved their lives. Not really. Unless they later repented, they lost their eternal life, saved their physical life for a short period of time. But also we can read in Fox's Book of Martyrs and other sources of myriads of Christians who when faced with that decision to either recant or die, they went to their deaths with a song of praise to God on their lips, knowing they had to finish what they had begun in order to be saved. The faithful must finish. And then we continue. Heaven is the future home of the few who are faithful where they will be free. Where they will be free. Freedom. What a precious commodity it is. Just several days ago, July 4th, celebration with fireworks and parades and everything. They do it right here in Dunlap, I found out. I mean, really. <laughs> well, we had a wonderful day. I tell you what, at the Herons and all the good food and, oh, yeah, and then at the Vons, I mean, ice cream. I've eaten more homemade ice cream in the last month than I've eaten in years. <laughs> and I loved every minute of it. But we celebrate freedom in that sense, and it is a, fresh, a precious commodity. But we can read in Scripture of the freedom that if we are faithful children of God now, we also enjoy. We're free from the law of Moses, a law that no one could keep perfectly other than the one who lived and died sinlessly and perfectly, Jesus Christ, and freed us from that law. We're free from the guilt and the burden of sin if we're faithful children of God, cleansed continually by the blood of Christ. And so there is freedom about which we could speak that is precious indeed, spiritually and physically from that standpoint, but, but there is a freedom that yet awaits us, yet awaits us that, that is perfect freedom, where we're reminded in Revelation 21.4 that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. No more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, there is no more pain, for the former things have passed away. No matter how good our lives are here, there is pain from time to time. There is sorrow. There are tears that are shed. But the time is coming when time is no more, when all that will change. And it will change how? It will change forever because that's our last word in our one-sentence sermon. Heaven is the future home of the few who are faithful where they will be free, how long? Forever. Freddie illustrated it beautifully in a recent lesson when he talked about the bird coming to one shore, picking up a grain of sand, taking it to the other, and depositing it and doing that. And when he had finished all of that redepositing, eternity would have just begun. It's very difficult for the finite mind to grasp eternity, forever. And yet, it is the case that heaven is forever. Matthew 25, 31 through 46, as we close, reminds us of the judgment scene, and Jesus projects himself into that judgment scene in that text. And he reminds us of one of the bases upon which that judgment will be determined. He deals with benevolence in that context, Benevolence is not the only basis upon which we're going to be saved or lost, but it is an important part of our work in the kingdom, obviously. 
And when he talks about those who gave him a drink and those who didn't, those who visited him in prison, those who didn't, the sheep and the goats, he says at the conclusion, these on the left will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. That's the most sobering text I can think about in regard to eternity in all scripture because it tells me that as long in duration as heaven will be so will be hell and that is sobering beyond description because you see although the text says everlasting punishment and eternal life the two words are exactly the same in the original and everlasting and eternal are obviously synonymous and so what he says is that those who go away into punishment will go away eternally punished. And that is sobering. Sobering beyond description. But the righteous into eternal life. So what is heaven? It's the future home of the few who are faithful where they will be free forever. What will eternity be for you? Eternal light, where there is no darkness, joy and peace and happiness beyond the comprehension of the finite mind at this point? Or will it be the, the darkness, the outer darkness, and the punishment of hell for all eternity? The choice is ours. And God is not going to send anyone to hell. We're going to send ourselves if we indeed go there. But he's given us the wonderful opportunity to make hell an unnecessary reality. It's a reality, but it can be and will be an unnecessary reality for all those who will contemplate how beautiful heaven must be as we have sown, and do what is necessary to make that heaven their eternal home. It begins with a belief in Jesus as the Christ. John 8, 24, except you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. But we must also repent, Jesus said. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish, Luke 13, 3, and again at verse 5. And beyond repentance, we must sweeten our lips with the most beautiful and significant confession that has ever been or ever shall be made before man. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then we're ready to culminate our obedience and reach the blood that will save us by being buried with him in baptism where his blood is applied to cleanse us from all sin and to allow us to rise to walk in newness of life added to his kingdom, the church, where if we remain faithful according to the teaching of Scripture, we have as our crown that awaits us eternal life, life itself. Do you have that hope? If not, you can have it before you leave this building this morning by bringing your life into compliance with his will and becoming a Christian. Or if you know this morning that once you had that hope and you had that blessed assurance that Jesus is mine, but he's no longer because you've turned your back upon him and have sinned in a way to bring reproach upon the church and upon him and need to confess that sin in a public way, saying simply, I have sinned. Pray with me and for me. We'll do just that eagerly and happily to a God who loves you supremely and who will forgive you completely and blot from his book of remembrances forevermore every sin that's against you. If that's your need, we plead with you to come as we stand to sing to encourage you.